Thank you so much for the uh, kind introduction, and it's a real um, honor to be uh, presenting um, on this forum. So thank you once again for the invitation. Um, today, uh, I'm, as you most of you probably know, that I am an orthopedic surgeon. I specialize in um, shoulders and elbows. Um, I work on the NHS at Bard's Health, which is part of the Royal London Hospital, uh, which is Europe's biggest trauma center currently. Um, but I do have some other hats on, including being the medical director of a group of orthopedic surgeons in London called Orthopedic Harley Street Specialist um, Hospital. Uh, today, we want to talk about something relatively straightforward um, in the, sh the shoulder world. In orifice, your, you would see lots of people with this, i.e. ACJ instability. So without further ado, I will uh, proceed. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, well, we're going to talk about the basics first. So we're going to talk about AC joint anatomy and what keeps the joint stable. For ACJ instability and my personal thoughts on that classification. Then, for those of you who are um, more surgically oriented, injuries, and we'll touch base upon the management of chronic injuries as well, which is often slightly different in these cases. And finally, a little bit on techniques for fixations, what is out there, and what my current preference is, is on why. So, let's talk about the joint stability. So AC joint, like any other joint, is kept in place by various factors. As we know, there are static factors as well as dynamic things that control any joint. Okay. Now, for a glenohumeral joint, for example, we know that dynamic factors like the rotator cuff play a massive part in it. Whereas, for example, a different joint, like a hip joint, we know the static factors play a much more significant role. For every joint relies on ligaments, bony congruency, as well as muscles around it to control it. In addition to a good functioning neurological system. So what are the static things that we deal with in the AC joint? So this is a picture of the clavicle going into the ACJ, I, uh, a snapshot of the shoulder girdle, the bony anatomy with the ligaments. Where you see that circle is what we will call the AC ligaments and including the joint capsule. Just below that, you have the CA ligaments. But the main ligaments that provide stability to the AC joint, which is circled, is actually slightly away from the joint, i.e. the crococlavicular ligaments, which have two parts, the trapezoid and the more important part, the conoid. These are very, very important ligaments that are involved in the stability of the ligaments. And although they are static points, you can see that they fan out and they have a different direction of uh, attachments. So they end up providing a good three-dimensional stability to it. So as far as AC joint is concerned, the ligaments provide a significant amount of stability to it. But let's not forget the bony anatomy. The bony anatomy is also quite important. So the AC joint itself has some congruence. And we know that when you lose the end of the clavicle, you get a lot more anterior and posterior draw, i.e. anterior posterior instability. So, here we are talking about the bony anatomy, right? In addition to all the other ligaments that are there as well, just a different way of looking at it. Now, I just want to show you all the different muscles that are attached to it. We often forget how large the muscles are that attach around the clavicle and the acromion to stabilize the shoulder girdle, as well as provide significant stability to the AC joint. So trapezius, deltoid, 
big, massive muscles, and and which are provide so much of the stability around the AC joint. So people often forget when they're treating and managing AC joint instability that the muscles play a large factor in this. This is a good slide. I often use this for my teaching. Um, it talks about the age and what diagnosis you expect. So if I'm a shoulder guy, if I'm teaching trainees and so on, I often put this slide up, even to medical students. Uh, in fact, my five-year-old, my son, when he was five years old, could use this simple algorithm and figure out what the most likely cause is when a patient presents to you. So age is so important. We know that as you get older, you tend to get arthritis, including arthritis of the ACJ, full thickness cuff tear. And there's a whole middle age group where you may get ACJ pain. But if you're talking about the younger age group, that's where you see trauma. That's where you see injuries. So we tend to see a lot of ACJ dislocations in the 30 odd year old. Now, I live in London. Um, there are a lot of people that I want to do cycle more and more. It's great for fitness. But London is not designed for cyclists yet. So it's a very dangerous place to cycle. So a significant number of my patients um, that on the NHS and private are actually cyclists that fall over. And when they fall over and they hurt themselves, they often tend to break their collarbone or dislocate their ACJ. And this is what it looks like. So on the right-hand side of the patient is what a typical bump that you would get from an ACJ dislocation. And on the left-hand side, you can see that there is some clear asymmetry between the two sides. So we know that there is a significant prevalence for this injury, right? So it is graded according to one and six, but the unstable type three and above is actually relatively common or approximately 15 out of 100,000 per year. And the incidence obviously depends on activity, right? So if you're a rugby player, you will have a big chance of dislocating your ACJ, and you, but you can get lots of traumatic shoulder injuries in cycling and other pathologies. So although I see a lot of rugby players because I treat professional athletes, because cycling is done so often that even those smaller number of patients hurt themselves from cycling, uh, I end up seeing a larger number just because there is a lot more cyclists out there. Just remember that there are lots of other intra-articular pathologies that can, that can be associated with ACJ. An ACJ dislocation is a very high energy injury and somebody has enough force to dislocate an ACJ in a young person, you have to think to make sure that nothing else is injured. So just because there's an obvious injury on physical examination by inspection and x-rays, please don't forget to make sure you examine the rest of the shoulder because there is more than 15% chance that there will be another significant injury to the shoulder, including a cuff tear or labored injury, which may need to be addressed. So here's a picture of you know typical person in rugby falling over on the tip of the shoulder, dislocating the ACJ. And similarly, when cyclists fall over, especially the good cyclists, they tend to hold on to the handlebars as for as long as they need to, and then they, when they fall, they fall on the tip of the shoulders. So what about the classification? I personally am not a fan of the classification, and I will give you my thoughts on it later. Um, but the Rockwood classification is the one that has been used. It's a classification based on x-rays, because again, it's a very traditional classification, which is many, many decades old. Uh, so we only had x-rays. And, and what the classification would show that on type one, the x-ray would look normal. But if you had the opportunity to assess or now in modern times, you do an MRI, you might see a sprain of the AC joint itself. Very stable injury, not really a problem. Type two is when you actually disrupt the AC joint ligament. And in most cases, this is also a very stable injury. And the main CC ligaments are still intact. Most patients 
do not require any surgical intervention. And in some cases, you require rest, non-steroidals, and then rehabilitation. So what about four, we're skipping type three for a second. There's, there's the type four where it apparently just goes posteriorly. goes superiorly. Type six, but apparently only one of my colleagues has ever seen, and if any of you have ever seen it, please let me know, because that's when the clav clavicle goes underneath the coracoid. It's so rare that I haven't seen it, and I see this as one of the most commonest injuries. So type one to five is what we would normally see, okay? is classified on the original classification by Rockwood that is between 25 and 100% displacement. It is likely that the CC ligaments are gone, but the displacement isn't enough to justify fixing or is a gray area. So there is some confusion. What do we do with somebody with type 3 that has got a dislocation? Clear, four, yes, it's clear. We probably operate as well, one and two. So, very basically, if you have a type one and two, we do nothing, but to address the pain of the ACJ may be something that we need to consider later on. When it comes to fours and three, because they're very likely to be unstable injuries. Six is rare, but of course we'll fix it. So what about threes? And the way I want you to consider this is actually not a constant classification because the classification can be very, very misleading. There are certain injuries that look like type ones and type twos. There may be a significant injury when you assess them. And certainly there will be type threes that actually are type fours and fives, but are only apparent when you uh, examine them. So the way to start thinking ACJ injuries is to simply decide whether this is a stable injury or an unstable injury. And we know that in most cases, type 1s and 2s on an X-ray tend to be stable. Type 4s and 5s tend to be unstable. And the ones that are kind of in the middle just need to assess whether there is instability or not. So I put it to you that x-rays are not a good way of classifying and then treating a patient. There will be some fives that you know that are very likely to be unstable. But if you just treat the x-rays, you will miss out a lot of ones that look like one, twos, and three, which are actually a much worse injury, but has not been recognized as such. So, what are the surgical considerations for these different types of injuries, right? So, type 3 injuries. Well, there are two different approaches, right? We do see some patients that have an acute injury, right? And the ones that we need to fix are the ones who would be high-level athletes, people who have, you know, uh, manual workers and so on that may want to... Um, you know, get back into the work and require a shoulder girdle to be very, very stable. But let's not forget the fact that there are a significant number of people out there that don't mind the cosmetic uh, deformity um, and will do really, really well with, without any surgical intervention. So imagine a, you know, 50 to 60 year old, not very active, sedentary lifestyle, dislocated the ACJ, you just have to consider what the future functional deficit will be um, and maybe justify not fixing that acutely. If you, on the other hand, have a high-level athlete or a weekend warrior that cycles every day, goes to the gym, does a lot of overhead sports and overhead weightlifting, then they need a more stable shoulder 
and therefore an ACJ fixation acutely is a good idea. So here's an x-ray of what a typical grade five would look like. It's pretty obvious. You can see the clavicle going all the way up here. It should be down by the acromion and this has gone through. Now you can imagine, although this is just an x-ray, you can imagine that the CC ligaments would have been gone, which go between the coracoid and the clavicle. You know for sure that with this kind of disruption, the AC ligaments are gone, and it's very likely that the whole deltotrapezial fascia sitting around it would have been torn as well. Straightforward, grade five, no problems, right? We are all happy with that. Well, what about this one, right? An x-ray seen in clinic, and you wouldn't think about it twice. But when the history suggests that somebody has AC joint pain, when somebody's fallen on it, you can start looking at it a little bit closer. It's a static x-ray, but we can see that the alignment of the bottom of the clavicle and the ACJ of the chromium is actually slightly different. The clavicle is relatively slightly higher than the other side. This may be a normal finding, but in this case, it was symptomatic. He had pain there. He actually had a lot more instability than what the x-ray suggests. Because don't forget that a lot of times when patients are injured, they will hold the arm in a sling. And the arm will automatically reduce the disruption to a much better level. So dynamic assessment of instability is quite important. So here it would be what's somewhere between grade two and three. Now, I believe the classification is flawed. We cannot think of ACJ disruption as a linear deformity. It can't just go up or backwards. We know it's not true. Nothing else does that. It is a three-dimensional rotational deformity, okay? We also know that the x-rays can show dynamic improvement. And this is what I was alluding to earlier. If you reduce your shoulder in such a way that you pull your arm elbow up, you can push your shoulder and reduce the ACJ. Similarly, if you put traction on your arm, you can exaggerate and make the deformity worse. So x-rays are not reliable, clinical examination is. Now what about four and five? We know that six is very rare and it's a different piece and probably rarely exists. But four and five actually are the same thing, right? It's very rare for a clavicle to go backwards or very rare for a clavicle to go upwards, right? So five is upwards, four is backwards. What really actually happens in real life is it goes upwards, backwards, and rotates because you have lost the ligaments. And we see this more often than the individual four or five, because if you do assessments and x-rays on these patients, you will see that on the strip axial or axillary, the same clavicle is going backwards and the same clavicle is going upwards. I.e., there is real no distinction between four and five. So examination becomes really important for decision-making and X, then the x-ray. And again, going back to the same thing that I may um, repeat myself, which is a really important take home message is, look at the classification, document it, but then ignore it. Think about whether this is a stable injury, where the clavicle is wobbling around, or whether this is a very stable injury um, and doesn't need fixing. So unstable things require an intervention uh, like surgical intervention, um, and the stable ones perhaps don't. So the next thing is that we often think of this as a clavicle injury. Doc, the clavicle is gone up. Well, it, that is also not true. Okay. So if you think of it as a clavicle has gone up, you may think of this as a fairly minor injury, but natural reality is anatomically from a description point of view, as well as actually what happens from it, the clavicle stays where it is. And is actually the whole of the shoulder girdle falls away. You gotta remember that the clavicle is the only bone that connects 
the body to the arm. Everything else is muscles and ligaments and so on. So one bony structure connecting the whole of the arm. And when you dislocate your clavicle, if it's an unstable arm injury, the arm falls away. That can be classified as a thick scapula syndrome, where there is scapular malposition due to the um, uh, destruction of the ACJ, either the scapula protracts the wings slightly because the inferior pole of the scapula becomes prominent. You may get some coracoid pain and impingement again because of scapular malposition and you get lots of dyskinesia of the scapula because you lose that stable base. So this is a real thing and this is something that we need to be aware of. Uh, when we're treating these clavicle injuries, ACJ injuries. So here's a 3D reconstruction of a typical patient. On the left-hand side, i.e. right of the screen, is a joint, AC joint, in the normal position. Okay? So the both views, one from the front, one slightly looking from above, you can see exactly what the position is. But if you look at the right-hand side of the patient, i.e. left of the screen, you will notice what exactly I'm talking about. You notice three things. Firstly, on the picture above, the AC joint has gone up, i.e. what will typically be look on an X-ray as a grade 5. What you see on the bottom picture is something that looks like a grade 4. So if you play, play, close attention what has actually happened and is that if you look at just the clavicles the clavicles the left and the right one are exactly in the same position what has actually happened is the right shoulder girdle has fallen away rotated away so this is what happens in an AC joint and once you start thinking like that you recognize that a clavicle dislocation ACG dislocation is actually a shoulder girdle dislocation and a much more significant injury than people may think. So here's another example. This, this patient of mine had, um, was actually one of the staff members. He's had about nine, ten surgeries under four or five different surgeons. He's had everything done. He had um, everything to make it stay. Uh, he's had, you know, we were done, you know, he's had a hook plate, he's had grafts, allografts, synthetic grafts. He still has some synthetic grafts in. His position was, looks okay on x-ray. We can see there's a little bit of a gap, but maybe it is slightly high. Um, and if you look at the auxiliary view, we can see that, again, maybe slightly backwards. It didn't look too bad. But he had a lot of pain. But if you look at his pain, where was his pain? His pain was basically neck, trapezius. He was getting traction from his plexus because... Ali, Ali yes. your hand is on the speaker. So how is that now? Yeah, yeah that's better. Apologies. So, so we can look at it and his... What we saw was that his, he was getting trapezius pain. He was getting... A traction of his brachial plexus because his shoulder girdle was the right was wrong position. So he's going numbness and pain in the T1 distribution. So clearly he had a classic thing of six scapula despite the surgeries. So this is again looking at the same person, 3Ds. You know, we can do all sorts of uh, imaging on it so we can see what it looks like on the outside. And I'm just going to rotate this around. And just want to demonstrate. It's the same person. And just look at it, right? If you look at it from the side, you can see that although the linear alignment may look okay, the scapula is completely rotated outwards. And this gentleman essentially required me to recognize this. And then, and this was apparently apparent clinically as well, by the way. So I've got the CT as a demonstration uh, for the teaching purposes. Also to plan his surgery because he had so many other bony work done. But it's a good demonstration to show that when you saw this guy clinically, you would see that his scapula is so malpositioned. And if you reduce the rotational deformity, uh, you actually will correct the symptoms. 
Uh, so another guy, you know, again, just to demonstrate something that looks like a typical grade three on the AP, but looks like a grade four. Often a combined thing because the grading for Rockwood is probably not right. This is again a very unstable injury where it's gone upwards, backwards and rotated. Similar guy, right? You, you'll see his um, imaging here. He's under anesthesia right now. You see that little bump there. And I'm going to see if this video plays as well. And hopefully you can hear this sound as well. Four slash five ACJ dislocation. So great four five slash ACJ disruption. Um, the clavicle is comes down here. And this is the end of the clavicle. That's the end of the clavicle. This is right in the subcutaneous tissue. Just under the skin. This is meant to be down here somewhere. Yeah. So it's obviously gone. So I'm just pointing out where the clavicle is supposed to be and clearly and how it's poking backwards. So even on visual inspection, we can see this clavicle has gone backwards like a grade four and superiorly like a grade five. Again, a three-dimensional rotational deformity. Very, very unstable on palpation. Um, another picture. Now this you would see as looking normal, right? That's a pretty normal looking x-ray on the first glance. There is no evidence that has gone upwards or backwards on any of these x-rays. So this guy came to me as a tertiary referral with a lot of ACJ pain and symptoms suggestive of ACJ instability. If you look at his x-rays, on the right hand side, that is normal x-rays. On the left is the abnormal x-rays and once again, what I've purposely done is put the shoulder girdle in the normal position, and I'm just demonstrating the position of the clavicle. If you look at the clavicle on the right-hand side of the patient, I left off the screen, you will see how nice and square it looks with a good alignment. On this other side, you see that although the alignment is good, it is actually rotated by about 40, 45 degrees. So again, symptomatic instability, rotational deformity, although the alignment looked good. Um, and when I did an EUA on him, so this is an MRI scan, again shows complete destruction of the AC ligaments, CC ligaments strain, but not torn, um, but still having symptomatic instability. And I am now going to do a little demonstration in theater. He's asleep. And what I can do is literally move his shoulder girdle backwards and forward. Very, very unstable. And again, a very grateful customer once you stabilize the AC jet. So the take home message we're saying is that examination to confirm the ACJ instability is very important. I'll just repeat that again so you can really see how I move the shoulder girdle back and forth. and how, what a minimum pressure requires just and to push the clavicle back and forth. So, so my take on management is grace does not matter that much. Do not rely on x-rays or even 3D CTs. Always examine the patient in the clinic because that'll give you almost all the information you need. And x-rays and MRI scans, they're the icing on the cake to then further manage. There's also no immediate rush. Most of the acute injuries can be easily fixed within the first six weeks and have a great outcome. And the chronic stages, if you do them, and I'll show you the difference in how I treat them, waiting can still give you good results. So if I have a patient that has an acute or chronic ACJ, within six weeks, I would treat this as an acute injury. Um, we often think that the CC ligaments tear in intra-substance, but usually they strip off as a periosteal sleeve from the underside of the clavicle. So you don't need to augment with um, any kind of grafts, whether synthetic, allografts, autografts. In the early phases, if you just reduce it and provide three-dimensional stability to the construct, then the ligaments and the, the stripped off with the periosteal sleeve heal quite nicely. So I will use a dog bone from arthrex 
or even go really old school and use a hook plate, which is really, really robust. The only problem is that you need to remove it. But these are just tools to provide stability so that these AC ligaments, sorry, CC ligaments can heal. I will do a repair of the AC ligaments and the capsule, uh, especially the posterior capsule that provides a lot of proprioception. And I'll do a formal repair of the muscle. But as far as implants are concerned, anything that provides stability is good. Once you reach the chronic stage, it's a different matter. Suddenly you're thinking that it may not heal and any kind of implant may fail if the ligaments are not there to support it in the long term. So I still might use a dog bone and hook plate, but I would probably put a, a graft, whether it's synthetic, like a lockdown ligament, or a uh, allograft or autograft. I don't tend to use too many autografts, but allografts and synthetics are my go-to. So when you think about surgical treatment for acute injuries, address all the stabilizers of the joint. That's important. So there is a periosteal sleeve avulsion of the CC ligaments. You need to reduce the clavicle and hold it stable. And those ligaments usually take care of themselves. Repair the posterior capsule of the joint and the AC ligaments because it's right in front of you. The posterior capsule is, provides a lot of stability and proprioception. Very important. This is not controversial as I'm concerned. Lots of people have shown this including Muzaka in uh, anatomical studies, please do not resect the lateral end of the clavicle. Lots of people will have, um, you know, guidelines and optics and say, resect the end of the clavicle because it may get arthritis. Arthritis of the ACJ is part of life. People get gray hair and wrinkles, they'll get ACJ arthritis as they get old. It doesn't hurt and it only hurts when it's unstable. So usually people don't get arthritis and if they do get arthritis eventually, like they normally do, it doesn't hurt. And take it from me and take it from the literature, having treated thousands of these patients, removing the lateral and the clavicle is not beneficial because people don't tend to get ACJ pain. I've had one or two patients out of literally thousands I've done and they respond went to one or two injections, acid, never had to resect an ACJ. But resecting the ACG acutely can result in a lot of anterior posterior instability. And, and we know that bony anatomy is important for stability, along with the ligaments and the muscle. So please uh, don't remove it. You can remove the intra-articular intra disc, which is occasionally not present if the patient is older. But if it is, it can be ruptured. So remove that because it can be neurogenic and a source of pain, but preserve everything else. Now, I spend a lot of time and effort repairing the deltoid and trapezial damage, as well as doing a formal Mason Allen repair of the deltoid trapezial fascia to wrap around the clavicle construct. So when you've done your fancy treatment of uh, dog bones and so on, don't walk away quickly and let your juniors just close up the muscle right on top. No, do a proper formal repair of the muscles because that is very, very important for stability. So, for chronic injuries, same, but just I need to augment with some kind of ligaments. And, you know, I tend to go for synthetic ligaments in this case. So my take is patient factors are always important, work demand, even cosmetic is important, athletes fix them. Consider other symptoms from the shoulder girdle. The concept of six scapula is important and people do get plexus traction, pain, scapula dyskinesia, right? But there is no immediate rush. You can wait and do these late as well if the decision-making is not clear. And again, acute, I tend to see them early. I tend to see most of them for rehab. Um, unless there are athletes and so on, I would make a decision to go ahead at three to four weeks. Of course, if it is tenting the skin and grossly unstable, I will um, fix it quickly. Chronic, definitely rehab them all because you've already lost the chance of doing an acute injury and you can wait for as long as you want. So if somebody's having problems around the shoulder girdle, there's nothing to do by doing rehab. 
And this prehab works wonders if you end up doing surgery in the end. But a significant number of them that have symptoms in chronic instability where you've not had the chance to fix it acutely, rehab by itself can avoid them surgery. So, few things to finish off on how I do it. This is the last few minutes. This is not the important part of it. You can fix this with anything that you feel comfortable with. I, I, arthroscopic is good, but remember that there are, and it's especially good for intraarticular pathology. So I tend to scope most of my patients, especially if I have clinical suspicion of any other labral capsule injury or, or a cuff injury. Uh, but usually it tends to be a diagnostic score because 80 to 85 percent of the patients don't have anything else. I tend to do more often an open repair only because it allows me to address all the other anatomy, including the injury through the deltoid, better. So if it's a grade three slightly unstable, then I can do it arthroscopically. But a big massive injury that has been complete disruption of the muscle, arthroscopically won't address. The, mus uh, the muscles themselves. So quite often it ends up being open or a combined procedure. Lots of different ways to fix it. And we know when there are hundreds of different ways to fix it, there isn't a good way to fix it, but we just need to recognize what we're trying to achieve. And then what we're trying to achieve is actually good stability to allow the ligaments or this to heal or the synthetic or the artificial ligaments that we put in to kind of incorporate. So you want an implant that provides you with good stability. So a hook plate is good, a dog bone is good, and lots of different ways to do it. Um, and I, I use some of the arthrex implants. So these are some of the techniques that I use for doing a chronic reconstruction, right? So Muzaka technique, you know, it allows me to put some allografts um, as well, through some bone tunnels, provide both a some kind of biology as well as some stability. Um, I have used hook plate quite a bit, right? So quite a few times um, when in acute cases, especially in high demand athletes with massive shoulders, I find that sometimes these small little buttons and so on are not strong enough. Again, you've got to remember that you are relying on these small buttons to literally lift the whole arm up and keep it in place. It's not reducing the clavicle, you're reducing the arm to the clavicle. So when some big guy, some big guys, a lot, uh, something like a hook plate, although it is an instrument of the devil if you don't know how to use it properly, um, I tend to use it because I use it three months down with good stability as I've repaired the muscles and the capsule, you take it out, and again, in a series of over 400 cases of just acute hook plates, no issues at all. All patients have very, very good stable shoulders as long as you respect the fact that you put in the hook plate and repaired the muscle, not cut the bone off and preserve the AC joint. So this is what a hook plate looks like, but you can have problems with the hook plate. So remember you have to take them out and not allow them to contact sport before slide. Again, this is another one way of doing it. So there's a lockdown ligament that I've used uh, I find is a very good augmentation, but often very difficult to position the clavicle anatomically with the right tension. Um, so just skip through the last one. I'm just gonna show you again, another sample of how I do it using a dog bone. Um, but what is important is that you guys choose an implant that is best for you in your practice, but try and achieve the concepts of providing good stability for acute injuries to allow for the injury to heal, or in the chronic cases, provide good stability so that the allografts or the autograph or the synthetic graphs that you put in have time to incorporate. So, lastly, um, in some cases, you may find that you've done your grafts and everything else, and you still have some anterior posterior instability. So sometimes I have put in uh, screws with what's called an internal brace. I used to do them 
before the internal brace came out uh, in cases that require it. But obviously, the internal brace makes it very easy. Whereas actually, two anchors with a bit of tape can provide an immense amount of anterior posterior instability control in cases where you have that anterior posterior instability after you've done your CC ligament augmentation. So, lastly, rehab after fixation. Because you've achieved good, strong stability, the key is to get your patients going pretty quickly. So, most of my patients go through an accelerated rehab program. They're allowed to do full hand, wrist, elbow, neck, scapula setting exercises immediately. At waist level, this allowed to do full internal and external rotation. No limitations, no limit at all. But I do limit them to do certain things. You got to remember that the most torsional forces to the construct or to the ACJ comes in at the end range motions of the shoulder. So I tend to make sure that patients can don't do hand behind back, cross arm a deduction or any elevation above 90 degrees for the first six weeks. And if I use a plate, I tend to use it, remove it between three and five months. So key points are, it's a shoulder girdle scapular injury, not a clavicle injury. Great less important than the clinical assessment. Rehab is very important, even in non-operative treatment. Address all the static and dynamic stabilizers, whether you're treating this conservatively or surgically. Acute injuries just need to provide stability surgically. But the chronic ones also require stability and some kind of augmentation of biology. With that, I thank you all for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Nurani, for that fantastic presentation. Couple of questions. Uh, one is, do you repair the coracoclavicular ligament when you're treating an acute AC joint dislocation? Are you trying to reconstruct that? Do you address that part? Uh, yes, so, so I have looked at quite a few of them. Uh, invariably, what happens is the CC ligaments uh, tear off as a periosteal sleeve, right? Um, so you, it's very difficult to repair it because if there isn't an intra-substance repair. And we think if it was an intra-substance repair, it probably wouldn't heal either, right? Luckily, it tends to be a periosteal sleeve avulsion. So as long as the clavicle is in the right place, those things heal well. So I don't formally repair the CC ligaments and never have. Do you think the use of a Bosworth screw was, does it make sense in today's uh, practice? Uh, so it may work in some people's hand. Um, the Bosworth screws in, so I, I, I have a bias practice. Uh, I still see some Bosworth screws, a lot less than I used to. Um, but my role was exclusively in fixing coracoids and fixing clavicle fractures with them or osteolysis and so on. It is just too rigid an implant. And more importantly, it's a one dimensional fixation from one point to another. And, and what is clear to me is that the AC joint dislocation is a three dimensional problem. So even the original dog bones and all the fancy things that I was doing early in my career, arthroscopically were two point fixations. And they invariably have a high risk of failure. What you need to address is a, is a three-dimensional thing. So the dog bone has multiple areas that has a wider footprint, but then you also address the, the AC ligaments, you address the muscles, you make sure you don't take the bone out. And quite frankly, right, in a lot of cases, you know, the old traditional hook plate works really well because yes, it goes under the chromium, but there's nothing like a hook plate or an AC joint to provide anterior, posterior, cranio cordial as well as rotational stability. But not for everybody, if you use it, two operations are needed. Um, and, um, and then basically you have to be a little bit careful they don't fall on it because you know, they can have cuff injuries, they can have acromium injuries. So you can't fix and forget that patient, right? They have to keep an eye on them. They need to know that needs to come out. Uh, but my, I'll be very honest with you, my, my, my precious high risk uh, patients that are the pro athletes and so on, invariably get some kind of hook plates because I find that there is 
they have a much bigger injury and they have nothing like it provides stability. But obviously, if you have a you know, young, uh, slim female um, that is more cosmetically worried about the scar, hasn't got a significant injury, shoulder is one third the weight of a rugby player's arm, yes, of course, um, something simple arthroscopically like a dog bone can do a job very, very well. Uh, so you've done quite a few hook plates, is it? Quite a few what, sorry? Hook plates, hook plates. You've done a lot yeah. of hook plates. So it is, is ACJ, ACJ uh, reconstruction is one of my most common operations. So, you know, uh, so uh, there are lots, I see it a lot, right? So, um, you know, I probably end up doing, uh, COVID is slightly different, but on a good year, I'll probably do 900 operations a year. Um, and I would probably say, you know, half of it is trauma and within trauma, half of it is probably ACJ or clavicles. So yes, I've done lots of them and lots of hook plates in particular. And uh, have you had any stress fractures of the, of the medial end of the plate? One, uh, one uh, fracture uh, of, on the medial end of the plate uh, in a slightly older gentleman in his uh, 60s, perhaps with slightly osteoporotic bone um, and with a acute injury falling off. He was, he was a sorry old gentleman, but he liked his skateboarding. Um, so he fell off a skateboard and he hurt his shoulder. That's the only case I know because I know all of them, right? So now there are some cases where I see very rarely some osteolysis. Again, very, very rare. But what I've found is that when you use a hook plate and if you get the tension right, I get a fairly rigid fixation um, and you repair the muscles, don't take the AC joint out. Either you have, I, you have a very stiff anatomical construct, then there is hardly any movement in the AC joint in the first six weeks, especially because you're, you're limiting the range to waist level. So then you don't get anything at all. So invariably, most of my patients will not get stress fractures, but they'll also not get any hint of osteolysis because the fixation has been fixed so rigidly. And you remove the plates at three months? Uh, yeah, so three to six months, but invariably my patients end up having some time between the end of fourth month and middle of the fifth month. So there is a slight convenience factor as well. So a few weeks here and there. Uh, the, the only exception to removing the hook plate slightly longer will be if there was a far lateral clavicle fracture, uh, then I confirm that the bone is healed before I do it. And sometimes people take a little longer. Um, when I take the hook plate out, I always have um, a augmentation device like uh, artificial ligament and so on, just in case it is unstable. Um, I have done so many of them and not once I had to use it because once you take the whole plate out, I, I stress it imagery wise and so on. And it is actually very, very stable. Um, but I think it's stable only because you use the right hook plate size. And some people might feel that they want to protect the shoulder by using a, um, a larger hook or make it slightly looser. No, go for the tighter one because that is actually better for stability and you get less problems with it. Uh, and if you repair everything else around, it all heals beautifully. I mean, the deltoid and the trapezius it looks absolutely anatomical with a nice mason allen repair when we take the hook plate out. So taking the hook plate out, shoulders are, AC joint is very stable and the patients basically get back to normal activity pretty quickly after that. So it's a very small second operation. And what is your approach for a type 1 and a type 2 rock wood? Type 1 and type 2? Yeah. So a true type 1 and type 2. Somebody has ACJ pain, uh, type 2. So I would, I would put it down as, uh, in, in my head, I would say a type 1 and type 2 is something that looks normal on x-ray, plus also is not unstable. But sometimes, as you can appreciate, that the... It may look like a type one, but when you feel it, it's actually wobbling everywhere, right? So, so a true type one, which is stable on an examination as well as no, looking normal on x-rays, I just rehab them. I just rehab them. Few of them get some AC joint pain uh, and they get an injection. Very, very rarely, if they get more pain, they'll do an ACJ resection. Um, uh, if I, if I, if, 
If I am doing an ACG recession or addressing a type one surgically, which is very, very rare, uh, and I chronically, if it's not been settled down, um, I find that it, it tends to happen is that either myself or somebody else has mistaken a type one or two for a proper type one, two, but actually was always an unstable injury. So type one or type two, if it's unstable and has been not recognized as such, will more generally speaking, more give problems. So those are the ones I end up uh, addressing late, especially when they refer to me as tertiary patients. Um, but otherwise, a normal straightforward one and two, I don't think um, most people are going to have problems with that. They heal quite nicely. So just and like, I think the message is like you need to have a three-dimensional approach and it is not x-rays alone, isn't it? Yeah. X-rays will lead you in the wrong direction. And, <laughs> and, um, you know, and uh, so, and in this case, what you need to do is examine the patients. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ali. I think there are no more questions. Thank you, Dr. Nurani, for spending your valuable time. This has been a fantastic session. A lot of insight into how to manage an AC joint injury. Thank you once again for being with us and looking forward for more from your side. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you again. Bye, -bye. Bye now. Have a good night.